Hello, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well. Bill, Bill that was a wonderful message and uh, certainly apropos and uh, interesting how it should correlate to what I'm going to talk about. Um, been a super, super, super busy, ah, very busy week for me. And part of that process is really what led me to the talk today. And um, it essentially revolves around, you know, speaking of peace and our sensation of inner peace, I've really been contemplating how this aligns with the larger life issues that we all contend as we continue to age and you know, sort of get rid of the sense of uh, invulnerability that we have as we're younger. So the issues of, for instance, impermanence, life and death, soul or no soul, these are all the pivotal questions of our existence and I've been deeply engaged in contemplation of these questions over the past week. You see, my mother is 86 and her body is degenerating. This summer, I witnessed her moving from independent living to being completely dependent upon my family and I to take care of all of her functions. She was with me for a couple of months this summer and then came back to Kentucky and last week fell down and broke her arm. So she can really no longer fend for herself and she moved to California yesterday. So my entire week has been taken up with a, a very elderly loved one of mine who is reaching an end stage of her life. Uh, now she cared for my father as his health declined, so she's really no stranger to this process. Don't, don't get me wrong, now I'm not putting her in the grave before her time, but I have observed firsthand the clear path of our existence and how quickly it passes. There's a Tibetan verse that states, life is fleeting like a rushing mountain stream. The emotional impact of our degeneration and decline is actually staggering. You know, I've watched this, I've watched the fear, I've observed my own fear in moving through life-threatening circumstances. When our body is no longer to serve us, we wither, we lose body functions, and we die. It is absolutely inevitable. It is the inevitable course for all sentient beings. That seems to be the reason that most of us try to avoid thinking about this inevitable phase until it's upon us. I feel blessed because I can be present and fully engaged with her throughout this really difficult time. I noted the beginning of my own degeneration as well. I'm in my 50s and I'm very aware of how the abuse I inflicted on my body at an earlier age is going to affect my ability to move in later years. So I can do everything possible to elongate my life regarding good nutrition, exercise, meditation, etc. But it's coming. Every day, every day, I move one step closer to death. So, the great question, what happens next? is prominently wedged in my consciousness. The subject of my very first philosophy course in college was prove or disprove the existence of the human soul. As my newbie classmates and I started and sorted through the writings of Plato, Socrates, Descartes, Kant, and all the others, it became clear to me that Kermit and uh, so Kermit was the nickname that I gave to my, uh, my uh, TA who was teaching the class because he looked and he sounded exactly like Kermit the Frog. Was less interested in pondering the deeper essence of these questions and more interested in our ability to use logical deductive reasoning as related to the assigned reading list. So in my rebellious 19-year-old fashion, I formulated my final argument by ignoring all of the reading and writing a paper on the essence of faith. 
So I chose that path because I felt that there is no way we can prove it one way or another. We have to rely on our intuitive grasp of a sense of higher reality. So I flunked. Kermit shot me down. I ended up getting an F on the paper, and uh, yeah, which was par for the course, I guess, given my, my degree of arrogance. I didn't follow the program. So 33 years later, after looking down a lot of different roads, I still feel the same way. So Kermit can take a flying fly leap, as far as I'm concerned. In the Tao, we return to the original essence. In Buddhism, we merge with mind, capital M. In Hinduism, the Atman returns to the Brahman. In Christianity, our soul returns to God. I don't want to leave out any spiritual paths, but you get the point. The main point of debate seems to be centered around retaining individual identity and residing in the blissful presence of God versus returning again to life to evolve or not, as the case may be, to a higher level of consciousness. Or do we just simply dissolve? Do we evaporate into nothingness? Volumes have been written on the subject, and I certainly can't sum it up in a few paragraphs. Even if I did have an answer to the question, I don't know what the universal consciousness has designed for us. But I do think there are some clues along the way. We are clearly part of the universe. We are clearly made of the same stuff. If this is the case, then the evolution of our collective paths must match up to a degree. All of the major religious and spiritual traditions say the same thing. Love and compassion are the roots from which our consciousness grows. What happens after we die? If we look at the experience of those who have died and came back, it looks pretty good. Of course, the scientists will tell us that this is nothing more than a series of chemical reactions in the brain. To me, that doesn't seem quite like an adequate explanation. That's not acknowledging an extraordinary universe that we are a part of, that on one hand we know very little about, and on the other hand we know everything about. If the Buddhist principle of realized mind, mind with a capital M, holds true, we only have to realize the truth because it already exists within us. And this realization of absolute reality opens the door through which we can experience past, present, and future simultaneously. So this is my lesson. I've been given the gift of being with my mom as she passes into the final phase of her life. I've been given the gift of a heart condition of my, my own that for 15 years has forced me to contemplate my own death. I get to practice my own death and hopefully find acceptance and peace. Despite all the debate and consternation, hopefully it, <laughs> it's not going to matter in the end because the truth is the truth. Once the physical existence passes, I'll figure it out just like everyone else has. So what's the point of fighting and worrying about it? So I'll end with this. I'll give you two contrasting examples of different paths that lead to the same end. My beloved Lama Chodak Gyatso Lumpa passed away from this existence in 2009. Up until the moment of his death, he was calm, peaceful, and concerned with helping others more than himself. He was a sterling example of unadulterated altruism. Last week, I spoke with one of my mom's neighbors, a guy named Tom Barnes. Tom's 85 years old. He's a regular guy who used to be a mail carrier, and he's a true Southern gentleman. He and his wife have been wonderful neighbors to my mom for many years. You see, Tom has cancer, and he's being treated with aggressive chemotherapy. Last week, Tom had a heart attack. And not a mini heart attack, I mean a full-on rhino slamming into your chest kind of heart attack. Yet all he was concerned with was helping my mom. 
he still asked if he could take out the trash cans to the curb. When I asked him how he was doing with all of this, he said the following. Well, I've lived a good life. They'll see if they can get a few more weeks for me, but that's in the Lord's hands, so I can't complain. Lama Gyatso is from Tibetan Nyingma lineage. Tom is a Southern Baptist, but the energy of both men was so similar. Boundaries. What a complete waste. I look forward to the day when these boundaries fade into the past and we can appreciate the beauty of our collective human experience and approach life's challenges together. This was a meaningful week for me. It was something where I had the real experience of seeing my mom as she gets ready to move into another plane of existence and the pain that comes with our body shutting down and I don't want to avoid it I'm really here I'm right here with her through the whole thing and that gives me a wonderful opportunity to practice on my own because it'll be coming for me just like it comes for all of us and uh, it gives me the motivation to be able to practice living in my life as it is and experiencing every moment for the precious gift that it really is. Thank you. I hope you guys have a great day. Ed, uh, thank you so much. There was another gentleman, another great man, whose life and passing affected both you and me very deeply, and that was Jerry. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So for, um, uh, for those of you who uh, probably aren't sure who I'm talking about, Jerry Petit uh, is um, Ed's Sifu. Uh, Jerry himself uh, is Bruce Lee's student. Uh, in my opinion, Bruce Lee's top students. He was the one guy who really got what Bruce Lee was teaching. Um, not only the physical aspects of what Bruce Lee was teaching, but also the philosophical aspects. So he lived his life uh, along with his wife, Fran, who's also uh, uh, an incredible martial artist herself. They lived their life in accordance with those teachings, um, touching uh, lives of people all around them, including including Ed and myself and Ed's students, uh, and so forth. So, you know, I had this privilege of meeting both uh, Jerry and, and Fran uh, previously uh, at their uh, place, and it was a, it was a very simple uh, encounter, and yet it was also very profound. And mm -hmm. I, I don't really know that much about the, uh, the physical aspects of the arts that they practice, I just know from what other people talk about, that even when Jerry was in, in his later years, the way that he moved was, it was still incredible. He was still demonstrating his proficiency, his expertise, his abilities, um, you know, up until the very end. So uh, I had the, had the chance to write sort of a, a eulogy with Ed, uh, which, which, which Ed was able to, to read at, at a uh, gathering for, for Jerry. So that was another, you know, that was another thing. And it, it happened, you know, and it, it wasn't even that long ago. It feels like it only happened very recently. So, yeah. you know, this is all part of the same overall lesson, I think. Oh, I completely agree with you. I mean, and, and what you wrote was very meaningful, and he really wanted that. I mean, he, your writings really touched him, Derek, because you know, he, he was a true Taoist, and... Um, th at that memorial, it was really touching because we had, you know, Shannon, his daughter, or, or Bruce Lee's daughter was there, Linda, his former wife, was there, uh, Jason Scott Lee, who Jerry trained for the movie about Bruce Lee's life, and, you know, everybody was able to sit there and, um, and, and listen to these readings, listen to the talks, and there was a, a real common experience of how 
Jerry, you know, the philosophy was really the most important part in the driving impetus behind his whole practice of Bruce Lee's art of Jeet Kune Do. And, you know, a lot of times people get hung up on all the physical parts of it and all, and all that stuff, but that's just the first step of it. I mean, it's a, it's a path of evolution and growth and development like Tai Chi, like Qigong, like, like Hapkido, like karate, like kung fu, like anything, it does, I mean, then that's what I think Sigong Bruce was trying to say, is that it absolutely doesn't matter, that the boundaries make no difference whatsoever, it's just about how we begin to evolve as individuals. Absolutely, and also um, talking about, you know, Jerry and the life that he led with, with Fran, um, just want to say one thing, and that is, you know, our typical conception, you know, that we get from kung fu movies and whatnot, the the master is this old dude. Um, I just want to say that in real life and also in the Tao, women have just as important a place in every level of spiritual cultivation and cultivation of the physical arts. So you you get that, I think you get that message more than anything else when you encounter a friend for the first time because there she is. She's, a, she's an absolute master at what she does. She's like this, you know, bearded old guy in you know, a kung fu movie except she's very female, you know, very wise. And she will provide you with you know, her experience and words of wisdom uh, from her years of training and learning and so forth, uh, I still hope to see that, you know, one day we will see depiction of that. So people won't end up with the, the same, same old idea as before that somehow it seems like, you know, this Kung Fu thing is just a male-dominated, male-oriented activity. Uh, friend is a living testimonial that in the Tao, you know, the, the woman, is, is the mystic female. The woman has a special place, an important place, and an indispensable place. Oh yeah, absolutely, and that energy that's brought to it, you know, the yin energy is crucial. I mean, that's what Wing Chun was based around, was a woman, a Buddhist nun, who developed the system. And uh, yeah, I think Fran, the way that Fran describes her mom, or no, the way that we generally just describe Fran is Fran is like the grandma who could kick the living crap out of you. <laughs> she's, you know, you just would think she's just this older woman, and when you see her move, man, it's a completely different game. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and I know what's practical and what's not, and uh, uh, she she could do some serious damage if she needed to. She's also a weapon specialist. Just, just... <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Ed.